In this video, I want to provide an introduction to propensity scores and I also want to explain their significance by means of introducing the propensity score theorem. So first of all, what is a propensity score? So the idea here is that we have two groups of people. We have those individuals who receive the treatment. So in the example we've been speaking about in the last video, those individuals who did receive on the job training or chose to receive on the job training. And we have those individuals who didn't receive on the job training. And what we can do is we can think about there being a propensity of an individual who has a set of covariates in XI to actually choose the treatment. So what do I actually mean by that? Well, I mean the probability that an individual chooses Ji is equal to 1 given their list of personal variables. So that might represent in the example we've spoken about before, for example, that individual's past sales level in, let's say, the last year. It might also represent that individual's level of motivation. So more motivated people might tend to be um, more predisposed to choosing the treatment. So just to summarise, a propensity score is the probability that an individual chooses the treatment given their covariates. So how do we go ahead and estimate the propensity score for a given individual? Because remember we're here, we're dealing with a sample of the data and we don't necessarily have all the covariates nor the functional form exactly. So the idea here is that we might have data on a particular covariate, xi, and that xi might represent, for example, the past sales level of an individual i. And we also have data on whether an individual chooses the training and whether they don't. And what we might suppose is that because those individuals who are slightly better salesmen might be more better uh, motivated to actually do better, then there might be a sort of higher average level of personal or previous year sales level rather for those individuals who did receive on the job training composed uh, compared with those that didn't. And what we could do here in order to estimate the probability that an individual chooses to receive on the job training, so just to sort of reiterate this axis here, this y axis here is j i, what we could do is we could naively fit a linear probability model here. But we know that this is problematic because that actually leads to values of the probability which are outside of the range of 0, 1. They could be both greater than 1 and they can be less than 0. So that's not particularly sensible. So what we would do instead is we might fit some sort of limited dependent variable model. And in practice, one of the most commonly chosen models is that of a logic model. So the idea with a logic model is that we can essentially estimate this probability that an individual chooses to receive treatment given their list of covariates. And the logic model works by using a nonlinear function of a linear combination of the independent variables. So we represent this here by, let's say, phi, or often it's called lambda. And we say that it's phi of xi primed times delta, where delta here is just a parameter vector. And the idea with logic is that essentially as x prime delta tends to plus infinity, phi of that quantity tends to 1, and as x primed times delta tends to minus infinity, phi tends to 0. So that means that we essentially have our property uh, probability rather constrained between 0 and 1, which is what we want. So just to summarise, the logic model provides a way of estimating this propensity score for each individual within our sample. A more pertinent question to ask is, well, why do I care? Why have I actually introduced this concept of a propensity score? Well, one of the reasons why we think about propensity scores is because of the propensity score theorem. And the propensity score theorem is a corollary to the conditional independence assumption. So just to remind ourselves, the conditional independence assumption was that essentially the values or the potential values of the outcome variable, so in this case, the level of sales if an individual didn't receive on the job training and the potential level of sales if that individual did receive on the job training are conditionally independent of the treatment when we condition on the list of important covariates. Okay, so that's just the conditional independence assumption. A corollary from this, which you can prove quite easily, which I probably would in another video, is that the outcome variables, so y0i and y1i, in terms of the potential levels of the outcome, 
are themselves independent of JI, the treatment, if we condition on the propensity of an individual to receive treatment given their list of covariates. So the only difference between the conditional independence assumption and that of the propensity score theorem is that essentially here we're just dealing with the list of covariates, whereas here we're dealing with a function, and importantly a scalar function, of those covariates. So xi here is what we call highly dimensional, whereas the probability is just a scalar quantity, right? It's just a value between 0 and 1. So why is that beneficial? Well, if we think back to our previous example, where we were talking about the fact that there might be two important covariates which we need to control for when we're comparing the treatment group with the untreated, uh, and we spoke about the example of past year's level of sales and motivation, and we are stratifying across these two variables, and then what we were doing is we were hoping to compare the treatment group, so those with JI equal to 1, with similar subsamples for the untreated group. So again, we were stratifying in exactly the same way in our untreated group and hoping to compare subsamples. So we compare, let's say, cell A with cell A primed. And this was fine when we were dealing with just, let's say, two covariates. But when we were dealing with a list in practice, practice of sort of tens or even perhaps hundreds of covariates, then this no longer becomes practically possible because there might not be corresponding values of the treatment group which actually have individuals in the untreated group. So these cells mar marked X, for example, might, even though it has some individuals in the treatment group, there might not be any corresponding individuals in the untreated group. So we can't actually, for that particular group, actually estimate the average causal effect in this example. Well, what the propensity score theorem says that is that it doesn't matter how highly dimensional our data is, we don't necessarily need to use, or at least we don't need to stratify, across each of those individual covariates. All that matters is that for the treatment group, we stratify across the propensity scores of individuals within that treatment group, which is a function of this highly dimensional thing. But importantly, that function is a scalar function, so we're just dealing with strata in one dimension. And the idea is that once we have stratified across our estimated propensity score in our treatment group, and we have essentially found individuals who have the same propensity scores, or we've stratified uh, our untreated group in the same way across propensity scores, then what we can do is we can then compare individual strata, and then what that allows us to do is that allows us to come up with estimates of the average causal effect in each of the different subsamples, which when we sort of take a weighted average of those overall, that will then give us a very good estimate potentially of the average causal effect overall in the population. So the idea is that the problem with dealing with highly dimensional data is that it is very difficult to match individuals from the treatment group with those of the untreated group. And the propensity score theorem says that essentially what we can do is we can match across propensity scores. And what that says is that means that we don't actually have to have necessarily exactly the same levels of the covariates in each of our strata which we're comparing. All that matters is that we have the same propensity scores. And that's a really powerful thing because in practice, it's not often the case that we necessarily can compare one individual with an exactly analogous individual in the untreated group when we're comparing it with the treated group. And propensity scores allow us a much more sort of nuanced and a nicer way of actually coming up with estimates of the average causal effect. I should emphasize that the example which I've given here is an example which is known as propensity score matching. So essentially what we've done is we have matched, or that, that's in the bottom example really. In the bottom example here, what we've done is we've matched strata across the treated and the untreated group in terms of the propensity score. So that's matching across propensity score, which is known as propensity score matching. There are other and important ways which you can also use propensity score, and I'm going to talk about those in later videos. But just to say that this propensity score is a very neat and tidy way of allowing us to at least come up with estimates of the average causal effect and allow us to avoid this issue of highly dimensional covariance.